All right. I've mentioned that when information from the outside world gets transduced by our sensory receptors, it follows a route to a brain area that's specific to that sense, meaning wires from your ears, they're going to go to the auditory part of your brain, auditory cortex, while the wires from the touch receptors in your skin go to the touch part of your brain. If I was to actually take one of those wires, like let's say I take one of the wires heading toward the touch part of your brain and I give it a jolt of electricity, say by hooking up a little electrode to it, then the touch part of your brain would activate and you would actually experience, you would feel a touch even though nothing made contact with your skin. You could look down, nothing's touching your skin, but you would feel a sort of a phantom touch on you just because we've turned on those wires that go to the touch part of your brain and thus we turned on the touch part of your brain. I could even just directly stimulate the touch part of your brain and you'll feel a touch there on your body. So each system, each sensory system that we have has its own wires to its sort of dedicated part of the brain. Now, after that point, after which the info is going to get shared with other parts of the brain, it's going to get sort of remixed and processed further. So for audition, our sense of hearing that we're talking about now, let's see where those wires go in the brain uh, when the auditory nerve leaves our ear. When it comes out of the cochlea, we said it, it follows these auditory nerves, a bundle of neurons into the brain. Let's see where it goes. Get us to that auditory cortex area, the primary auditory area in the brain, and we'll talk a little about what happens afterward in the rest of the brain. So here is actually a view of the back of someone's head, but, but inside, into the brain. For each ear, you can see that they've drawn the auditory canal in sort of purple here. We've got the ossicle bones there in yellow, and then the cochlea spiraling here in red. And we've got arrows coming out of the cochlea. So again, that would be like neurons, or it's the pathway of neurons coming out through the auditory nerve. So it's coming out of those ears, and they've got, for stuff coming from the, the right ear, they've got blue arrows. For stuff coming out of the left ear, they've done red arrows here. So we can track where the information goes. Uh, the first stop we see at the bottom here, where things come out of the cochlea, the first stop is these little blobs at the bottom they've drawn in red. These are called the cochlear nucleus technically nuclei since there's one on each side, but on each side there is a cochlear nucleus. And from the cochlear nucleus, the info is going to travel up. It's going to go up towards the brain to the top part, the outer layer, the, the actual cortex up top that, you know, where most of the fancy stuff in the brain goes on. So the eventual goal is trying to get up and reach the auditory cortex up here in green. That's the primary, the initial real auditory processing center in the brain. But to get up there, we're going to go through a few waypoints on the way up there. So uh, as, the, as the info goes up through these other structures, I want you to notice what happens to some of the arrows coming out of the cochlear nucleus. So we've gone from the, the ear, the actual inner ear here, to the cochlear nucleus. This is technically we're starting in the brain, kind of these lower structures in the brain. But as those arrows come out, like following the, the info from our right ear, that's blue arrows, notice some of it goes straight upward, right? And it's going to continue up and stay on the same side of the head, the same side of the brain. So for the right ear, some of the info does go up the right side and get processed on the right side of the brain. But also notice the blue arrow goes across to the opposite side of the brain. It crosses over. We say it crosses contralaterally. And contralateral, that term, comes from contra for opposite and lateral for side, like a lateral pass in football is to the side. So as it comes out of the cochlear nucleus, the info from your right ear, some of it is going, actually a lot of it is going contralateral to the other side the left side of your brain, right, the opposite side of your brain from where the sound came in, and some just goes straight up on the same side. Actually, more of it ends up, as we'll see, is stronger on the, on the opposite side. Okay, the next stop, as we go up from the cochlear nucleus on each side, we end up the next stop at the superior olive. Technically, it's the superior olivary complex, but we'll keep it simpler, right, just superior olive. From there then, the next step as it goes up, the next chunk it'll go to is called the inferior colliculus. And this area actually does some interesting processing. It's kind of a switchboard, an integration zone, but we're not going to dive into that for this course. We're not going to get that deeply here. Uh, the most important thing to note is the, actually the little plus and minus symbols that are attached to those arrows feeding into the inferior colliculus on each side. Notice that the arrow is going straight up from the superior olive to the inferior colliculus on the same side, the ones that don't cross over, they have a minus sign. That means they're actually inhibitory connections. 
the the more that 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 particular blue arrow fires like this this one with the minus sign here the more that fires the more signals that go up directly up that way actually the the less firing you get in the receiving area the inferior colliculus here in other words it dampens activity in the inferior colliculus if i had activity here on the right superior olive i'll have less activity in the right inferior colliculus right afterward but notice the arrows crossing over. So if I have a bunch of activity in the superior olive, then I'm firing across as well. But there I've labeled it with a plus sign. That means those are what we call excitatory connections. The more those paths fire, so the more the superior olive goes off, the more it's sending signals across this way, the more that happens, the more this opposite side, inferior colliculus, fires. So we get more activity in the receiving inferior colliculus on the contralateral side, the opposite side. So actually m more of our hearing and audition is processed in the opposite side of the brain. It's processed contralaterally than the, than the little bit that stays on the same side and gets processed over there. Now, finally, from the inferior colliculus, right, we're here on the, on the little diagram. From there, we've just got one more stop before we get to where we're going, the auditory cortex we really want to get to. So the next place it goes, everything now is just kind of going up on the side it's already on. It's on whatever side the information is on now, it's just going to keep going up on that side to get to that side's auditory cortex. Well, the next stop is here in actually what, what's called the thalamus. It's a bigger area here, not, not drawn fully on this diagram, but on each side we have a, a side of the, the thalamus. The thalamus is often called the sensory gateway of the brain. We're going to see it over and over and over throughout this course because basically for just about all of our senses, the information passes through the thalamus right before it gets to the primary area in the brain for processing that sense. So, so it's called kind of the sensory gateway for that reason. We'll see it over and over. But specifically in the thalamus, there's a section, a little chunk of the thalamus called the medial geniculate nucleus. Medial meaning towards the middle, but medial geniculate, they've labeled here, it's medial geniculate nucleus, right, a clump of, of cells, of, of neurons. Um, but again, it's just a chunk of the thalamus there. We'll call it the MGN, medial geniculate nucleus, but MGN for short. That'll be easier to remember. Um, and then fi finally from the MGN, and we'll come back to the purpose of these you know, later, but from the MGN, the signal is finally going to go up to the auditory cortex, the primary receiving area for sound information in the brain. Specifically, we're going to call in green here, this little chunk it's going to, we're going to call this A1. We're going to call it A1 because it's the primary, sort of the initial auditory location in the cortex, in that outer important layer of brain called the cortex. And there are nearby areas that will be called things like A2 and A3 because they're kind of second and third in the step of processing. But the info all has to go to A1 first. It's a primary area. Only then can it be shared with those other areas and with the rest of the brain, right, to meet up with visual info that you're seeing or other info from, you know, knowledge and, and past experience or things you're imagining or whatever. Those might all interact, but that's later in the brain after it passes through the primary area receiving area, the primary processing area, the start. So again, for audition or auditory sense, we'll put an A in front of it to say it's auditory cortex, but one meaning primary auditory cortex. So now that we're to the cortex, that really sexy outer layer of the brain, let's zoom in on A1 and see what the hell this primary auditory cortex is all about. So we've kind of zoomed in here. The primary auditory cortex, you can see that's kind of in the, the orange or salmon kind of color here. And then they've, they've shown actually labeled the, the secondary auditory cortex, and it's called the belt area, um, that's around it. They've, they've shown that in blue. But let's just zoom in on A1. We just want to talk about A1, the salmon colored area here. The primary auditory cortex, it's, it's actually organized in a tonotopic map. The same kind of mapping, organized layout that we found in the basilar membrane back in the cochlea, that has been maintained all the way through those wires coming out of it, going through the auditory nerve, and it gets maintained and the receiving neurons here, a, the clump of neurons that we call A1 in the brain. So uh, what we could basically say is like individual neurons in A1, individual neurons here in the brain that we're looking at now, they will go off only for specific frequencies. So neurons that respond to similar frequencies will be right next to each other. One end of the, the clump of neurons here that we call the auditory cortex, one end of the auditory cortex will only go off for high pitch sounds and one will only go off for low pitch sounds. And there might be, you know, thousands of neurons here, but 
The ones at the very tip here, all those neurons maybe only go off for 20 hertz sounds. And all the ones here maybe only go off for 100 hertz sounds. And all the little neurons back here only go off for 20,000 hertz sounds. And again, it's because they got, they maintain that mapping because they got that input directly through individual wires from the cochlea, from the basilar membrane of the cochlea to these neurons, the individual neurons here in A1 in your brain. So the, the nice mapping from our inner ear is maintained here in the brain. You can see this is kind of almost a map of the basilar membrane from the base to the cochlea because it has the same function, the same purpose, the same layout. So if a bunch of neurons in the top right of A1, right, the top right of this image were to go off, that would only happen if there was high frequency sound waves coming into the ear. In other words, that means the activity here and the, the top right here, activity, so neurons going off here in A1, that represents, it sort of tracks high frequency sounds out there in the world. We now have a way for the brain to represent different facts about the world just in terms of neurons firing. Now, just a side note, I'm, I'm oversimplifying a little bit here when I say that every neuron has a specific frequency it goes off for. Um, Every, every neuron in A1 isn't necessarily going to fire just for one specific frequency. Rather, many of the neurons are what we might call narrowly tuned neurons, where they'll fire for a pretty narrow set of frequencies, uh, but they're, they have the most sensitivity at one specific frequency. So you can kind of say that's what it's tuned to. That's what it cares about. That's what really makes it fire the most, is what I mean when I say it only fires for that frequency. Um, so really, it, I mean, it's like most likely to fire for that frequency and that gives the most signal to the brain about that. It might fire a little bit for nearby frequencies. And then we do have some other neurons in there. Um, just, I just want to mention this in passing. It's not that important, but there are some that are more broadly tuned. And this is the case for, for other neurons in our brain too, but they might have a, at least a little activity for a pretty wide range of frequencies. But again, they have a, a very little range, a little area where they have sort of a specific frequency they're most attuned to, a specific frequency that makes them fire maximally. So in a very meaningful way, regardless whether it's narrowly tuned or broadly tuned, there is still a specific frequency or right around a little bit, a little tiny set of frequencies um, that, they're, that they fire the most to. So you could still think of those individual neurons as being specific to an individual frequency, as having a, a sort of characteristic frequency that it's tuned to the only thing it fires for. Okay, so let's move outside of A1 a little bit into the rest of the brain right now. And we'll get deeper into this stuff when we start connecting to other senses in the rest of the brain. But just for now, let's look at kind of think about areas like in this blue part right outside of A1, because all that we've got in A1 is a bunch of neurons that go off and say like, oh, I heard 600 hertz frequency, or oh, I heard 200 hertz frequency, or oh, I heard you know 14,000 hertz frequency. Okay, cool, but that's not enough info for our brain to do all the interesting things we do with sound. We need to send those frequency messages to other parts of the brain so it can look for patterns among them, more interesting combinations of frequencies and things like that, so we can recognize our friend's voice or make sense of someone's, you know, what someone is saying or appreciate music that we're hearing, things like that, or even just recognize fundamental frequencies and stuff like that. So as we go outside of A1 to like this secondary auditory cortex, blue in this drawing, or the areas as we start approaching that, we'll find specialized neurons that respond to things more complicated than an individual frequency. And one of the most interesting types of neurons are, are actually called pitch neurons. And pitch neurons are individual neurons that fire only to a particular pitch, regardless of the timbre, regardless of which harmonics are present or absent or strong or weak, doesn't matter. So remember here on the right, we, this is a, a um, picture we've seen earlier of three instruments, a guitar, a bassoon, a sax, all playing the same note. So they all are playing the same note. They all have the same fundamental frequency, right? It's 196 hertz is the fundamental frequency. That's the step between each of these. So. Uh, we have we have basically some neurons that will be able to recognize what it is that is similar between these three situations, despite the fact that we have different combos of frequencies and thus very different parts of A1 going off or going off in you know larger or smaller amounts or maybe even not at all for some of them. But we have a part of the brain that will recognize what is similar between this pattern of firing, which again would be a bunch of different parts of the basilar membrane, right? At 10,000, at 200, at 400, here, 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 at steps of 196, 
all of those neurons going off in a pattern, right? This is the pattern that would show up kind of like in that, that video where they unrolled the, the basilar membrane. That, that, that combo of things, that pattern, has some similarity to this pattern, some similarity to this pattern. That gets picked up on by some of these neurons outside of A1 and A2. These, these pitch neurons are one example, one type of specialized neuron, looking for a, a combo of simpler input. We'll see that is really common across all the parts of the brain that process sensory input that help us perceive things. It starts with something really simple, like just mapping frequencies, right? Which frequency went off? But then later you can have neurons that look for combos of frequencies, interesting combos, and allow us to recognize things like a particular pitch, a particular tone, right? Regardless of the, the individual makeup, the pieces, like which individual frequencies went into that, doesn't matter if it's the same tone. We have a neuron that will be able to tell the brain, this is the, the pitch, this is the, the tone, or this is the note that I'm hearing. So in other words, they, these pitch neurons, they don't just fire based on the frequencies that, that hit the ear, rather they, they fire based on the pattern of frequencies that, that have the same fundamental frequency, the same spacing. Uh, you can see an example of this actually in the, in the top diagram here, the top left. This is someone actually measured a, a pitch neuron in the brain. See, the activity will be the, the second part, the cortical response, meaning the response of, of neurons there in the cortex. So on the left side here, what we have are six example sounds that we might play that all have the same note. They're all, they're all the same note. They're all the same fundamental frequency, but a different timbre, right? A different harmonic structure. Because this one, the, the, the note is being played, right? It's the same spacing, so same fundamental frequency. But here the note is being played with just the first, second, and third harmonic. Here it's the fourth, fifth, and sixth harmonic, and so on. Bottom row is if we played the 12th through 14th harmonic, which is actually a lot of higher frequency sounds and no low frequency sound. So on the basilar membrane and thus here in A1, these six things that we might play, these six sounds that might come into our ear and get processed in our brain are gonna look very different. The first one, right, the first three harmonics might just be some low, low, low pitched sounds. And then this one here, the sixth version with the 12th through 14th harmonic might be higher, higher, higher sounds. And those are different neurons going off. They don't even have any overlap. None, none of the same neurons are going off here. And yet what we have is a pitch neuron having its, its um, response measured. So having a little electrode clamped onto this one neuron out in A2, outside here, and we find these neurons, we discovered these neurons called pitch neurons, showing that that one neuron will react regardless of which of these six sounds we play. All six of these sounds, because they have the same fundamental frequency, will make this one neuron go off, right? It's a, it's a little different in its activity, but pretty much the same and really only for that one pitch, that one fundamental frequency, or that one note. Uh, okay, so really what, what pitch neurons are encoding is fundamental frequency, and that's an example, a type of specialized neuron we have outside, uh, outside of A1. Okay, now in this case, for these, for these pitch neurons, what we have is a neuron that fires for something very specific. In this case, it fires for any sound with, let's say, a fundamental frequency of 182 hertz. That's where this kind of first line is, and that's the spacing. Each of these are 182 apart. So we have an individual neuron here that we would say, what does it fire for? It fires for sounds with a fundamental frequency of 182, or, or where the first harmonic is 182, regardless whether the first harmonic is present, or in all these sounds, the first harmonic is absent, the fundamental is absent. But just that, that thing that's common to them, that is what this neuron is tuned to, that's what this neuron cares about, that's what makes this neuron go off. And so we have a special term for that in neuroscience. In neuroscience, we, say that, we would say that this neuron's receptive field is sounds with a fundamental frequency of 182. It's a bit of a strange term, but basically receptive field or RF, the RF of a neuron, is whatever pattern of stimulation affects that neuron's firing. In other words, what makes that neuron go off, what that neuron is interested in. You can kind of say the RF, the receptive field, is basically whatever a neuron is tuned to. It's actually a term that we're gonna run into throughout this course, so I really wanna introduce it here. Basically, all the neurons in our sensory pathway and into the brain areas will have a receptive field, a thing that makes them fire. So I just wanted to briefly mention it here. Even the neurons 
all the way back in the basilar membrane, when we were in, in the ear, in the, in the cochlea, those neurons, we could say, have a receptive field. There's something that makes each of those neurons go off. And we can say, okay, then that neuron's receptive field is such and such. So remember that basilar membrane, right? The, the cochlea, the spiral thing, and the middle layer, the basilar membrane has a bunch of neurons. Those hair cells we talked about, those are neurons. Those are our sensory receptors. Well, each of those hair cell neurons has a specific thing that it fires for. It fired for a particular frequency of sound. And thus it's neighboring auditory nerve cell neuron, right? The little wire coming out of it for the next neuron to go towards the brain also fires for that same exact frequency of sound because it only goes off if it's basilar membrane neighbor goes off. So the different harmonic compositions that we see in the top left here, right? The different combos of sounds that all have some similar, you know, fundamental frequency to them, they would lead to very different neurons going off in the basilar membrane, right? The basilar membrane, if we had the one, two, three, what we'd be getting is three kind of lines going off at the start here at the base for this eight, nine, and 10 frequency, the, the eight, the ninth, and 10th um, harmonics, we would have some sounds going off, you know, more towards the middle here. And then for these later ones, maybe further, oh, sorry, I got that backwards. The, the one, two, three would be lower by the apex. And and then the high pitch frequencies would be closer to the base. But we have specific neurons, like neurons that will only go off for those specific frequencies and thus very different patterns of firing on the basilar membrane for these six different sounds, unlike that pitch neuron later in the brain. So the, we would say the, the receptive field of one single neuron on the basilar membrane, one of those hair cells, the receptive field of that neuron, let's say one near the base here, right? So near the base of the basilar membrane, its receptive field might be sounds at a frequency of 17,000 hertz. In other words, this neuron here near the base will only go off for sounds of 17,000 hertz or right around 17,000 hertz. There might be another neuron right next door that only goes off also for 17,000 hertz and a little further away, some neurons that only go off for 16,000 hertz. And one of those neurons, if I plucked it out, I'd say this neuron has a receptive field of 16,000 hertz. And there are other neurons here at the apex. Again, there's tons of neurons here, but there might be one near the apex here that only goes off for 20 hertz or one here that only goes off for 100 hertz. And I would say that the receptive field of that neuron is sounds of 100 hertz. So all of these neurons here, they have a receptive field. It's a term we can use just to say, what is it that, that makes this neuron fire? What is the sort of stimulation from out there in the world that would make this neuron go off? And, and again, that applies even for the neurons that are transmitting the info between the basilar membrane and the brain. So those little auditory cortex neurons, or sorry, auditory nerve neurons, the neurons that are bundled in the auditory nerve going towards the brain, those are each hooked up to an individual basilar membrane neuron. So there might be an auditory, uh, auditory nerve neuron coming out right where that 17,000 hertz neuron in the basilar membrane was. And so that auditory nerve neuron would also only fire if there was a 17,000 hertz sound. So we could say the auditory nerve neuron, the little wire going out towards the brain, that one has a receptive field of 17,000 hertz or whatever it is. Okay. So auditory nerve neurons, basilar membrane neurons, neurons in A1, they all have receptive fields. In this case, all of them just have a receptive field that is a specific frequency, right? The frequency that they're most interested in, that is their receptive field. That's the sound they listen for. But other parts of the brain have their more complicated receptive fields, like a combo of frequencies. Our pitch neurons had a more complicated, fancier type of receptive field. Okay, finally, of course, out there in the areas, you know, outside of A1, outside of the primary auditory cortex, where we get more complicated processing of sounds, those extra areas where the info gets propagated to after it starts in A1, there are a bunch of neurons with other specialties. It's not just pitch neurons out there. That's one cool type, one interesting type, but there's a bunch of other neurons with specialized properties looking for certain combos or patterns in the firing in A1. So for example, in addition to pitch neurons, there are also areas that respond selectively to changes in pitch. They're kind of our change detector neurons for sound. So in the, in the study shown here, where the data comes from here, it's an fMRI study. So patients were put in a brain scanner. Uh, well, they heard either a sequence with changing pitch, so the sounds were going up and then down and then up and then down and up and then down. 
So either changing pitch or they heard a fixed pitch sequence. So at other times they would hear just a, the same tone over and over and over again. The pitch doesn't change. And if we subtract the activity, if you take the, the activity across the two conditions and subtract them, you find the neural real estate that's dedicated specifically to tracking changes in pitch. And of course, there, that's just another kind of one example of another type of specialized neuron out there. We'll see there are tons of these throughout the brain, different things, different, different roles, different functions. Um, so there, there are lots of areas we'll get to. I just want to kind of point to a few here. Um, but other neurons that'll be specific to other parts of auditory signal or, or processing auditory scene. And we're going to dive in the next video into some more kind of real world scenarios. We'll start getting into more real world sound processing and, and functions and things we do more at the level of our individual everyday experience um, in those next two videos after this. But first, for the rest of this video, I just want to briefly talk about damage to the auditory system. So, so damage to our hearing system. There are two main types, and that, that they're called conductive hearing loss and sensorineural hearing loss. So let's just talk about, let's just introduce each of these briefly. The first type is conductive hearing loss, and this is when the, the uh, ossicles, those little bones, fail to transmit sound waves properly to the cochlea. There are a few ways this can happen, but most common is you know, you know, infection or like a tumor pushing on things. Um, we can also, you know, there can be a block, like if you have a, a bunch of earwax built up or an infection or something like that, um, can be part of what's blocking those, those ossicles properly transmitting the sound just because it's not enough getting in. So there's, there's ways that conductive hearing loss can look, but basically it's, it's unable to conduct the information from outside to the inner ear. So basically we're not getting the vibrations to the inner ear. We're not even getting there to where there are neurons. So we're not able to conduct the information far enough into the ear structure. Um, this can often be corrected with surgery uh, or hearing aids can be used sometimes to amplify depending on how much of this there is. So there are, there are ways to, to fix this. Um, turns out, just an interesting, interesting historical note, you may have heard Beethoven uh, was deaf, so one of the most really famous um, uh, people in music. He, he actually went deaf, but he continued working, he continued composing. He actually found that he could just hook up a metal rod to his piano, a metal rod to the instrument he was playing, and, and then bite down on it. And what would happen is the vibrations from the instrument would vibrate that piece of metal, which would vibrate his, his teeth in this case, and, and in other words, vibrate basically through into his skull. And that was enough to vibrate through to those ossicles and vibrate a little bit in his cochlea. And, and this isn't gonna be the same as normal hearing. It's not gonna be perfect, but it enabled him to hear uh, vibrations that, that uh, a process we call bone conduction. Now it says here, here perfectly, did not hear perfectly. Like bone conduction does not necessarily work just as perfectly, or it's very hard to get it that way. But you may have heard of bone conduction headphones. They're actually a technology we have today that you can use if you want to listen to music but have nothing kind of coming out, nothing going into your ear canal. Um, you can even put on like like um, something to block the the ear canal altogether and still be able to listen to music through bone conduction headphones that connect to a different part of your skull. Okay. But anyway, that's, that's conductive hearing loss. Probably more interesting and certainly more common is what's called sensorineural hearing loss. And don't get lost in this big fancy term. It's really just made up of two parts. So sensora, meaning like sensory, and then neural, meaning neurons. So it's just saying hearing loss that's related to the sensory neurons, right? We know what the sensory neurons are, the sensory receptors. Those are like those hair cells, the stuff in the cochlea or the neurons coming out of there, right? That would be the auditory nerve. So that's what sensorineural hearing loss is, is basically once we start getting into the neuron part of the ear, the stuff that sends neural signals to the brain, if we have damage or issues there or, or with the wires going out from there, that would be a type of hearing loss because we just can't get the signal to the brain, right? If you can't turn on those hair cells or if you can't pass the signal along with the auditory nerve, then the brain will never get uh, stimulated a1 won't go off, and so we'll never actually experience hearing anything. Even if the sound is out there vibrating the bones, doesn't matter. You never actually have an experience of hearing. You never can react to anything. You never can, you know, uh, recognize someone's voice or, or appreciate music or anything like that. Now, thankfully, sensorineural hearing loss doesn't always mean that you lose all of your hearing, all of your ability to to turn on those hair cells or send it to the brain. Rather, it may affect 
only certain frequencies, like if there's damage to part of the basilar membrane, but not the rest of it, then you would lose the ability to hear those frequencies, but the parts of the basilar membrane that are still there working and still getting vibrated by the, the ossicles and the sloshing, then those parts would still send info to the brain and you'd still be able to hear other parts of the, the frequency spectrum. So sometimes it's partial, right? Sensorineural hearing loss, not, not complete auditory deafness. Now the causes of this type of hearing loss, um, there, there are quite a few, but the, the most common cause is loud noises. Like loud noises, going to concerts, things like that are what cause you to lose hearing. And again, a lot of the times this is very permanent. You can also lose hearing either temporarily or permanently from certain drugs or medications. Um, there's also like genetic stuff that can cause this. So, so sometimes just congenitally from birth, you might have a, a hearing um, issue, but prenatal problems, disease, a number of other things. And as I said, this is the most common type of hearing loss, about 90% of hearing loss. All right, a little bit more about sensorineural hearing loss. Um, the most common way, as I said, to get this is damage from noise. So noise reduced or noise induced um, hearing loss. OSHA, the, the Worker Protection Agency in the United States, it actually mandates that workers don't get exposed to greater than 85 decibels for a long shift. Like it's a little bit, it's not as big of a deal if you have it just occasionally louder than that. But if it's during a long shift, you don't want to be consistently exposed to anything up in that range because you'll actually start to get major permanent damage. That's kind of a problem because things that people do all the time and often without any hearing protection uh, go way above 85 decibels. So we've measured in, uh, things like hockey games and, and if someone's like working with power tools, we consistently will have greater than 90 decibel sounds going into our ears. And remember, every 20 decibels you go up is 10 times more amplitude, 10 times more pressure, 10 times more damage. Concerts that you go to often go well over 100 decibels. It's actually even gone up over time, even higher. And headphones, even headphones that you can buy today, often crank well above 100 decibels. In other words, if you have your headphones cranked up really loud and are listening to them a lot, you are causing permanent damage to your hearing. There's a meta-analysis that came out not too long ago, uh, just sort of summarizing all the studies on this type of hearing loss. And they, they came to the conclusion, I've, I've linked it here in the slides, the most serious threat to human hearing, the most serious threat comes from prolonged exposure to amplified live music. In other words, concerts. Concerts are what cause most hearing loss, the, the biggest threat to, to hearing for, for humans today in the developed world. Um, Thankfully, studies have actually shown, there's a bunch of studies showing that earplugs at concerts helps protect against permanent damage. So there are earplugs you can get the, today that are, um, they go in your ear and are, are pretty hard to see, even some that are kind of transparent and don't stick out as much. So if you're worried about how you look, you don't even have to worry about that that much these days. And you can save your hearing so you can keep enjoying concerts later in life. Uh, just to give you a feel, again, going back to that decibel scale we talked about before, to give you a feel where we start getting dangerous levels and damage, basically as we get up to, again, about 85 decibels, so above you know normal conversation or just hearing some heavy traffic out in the city, we start getting to like standing near a subway, even 200 feet away from a subway that's moving, uh, then you're at the level, you don't want to be exposed to that for very long or you're going to have lasting damage to your hearing. But turning on your own stereo or headphones really loud, uh, working a power saw without ear protection on, and when you start getting up even higher, like I said, you know, a, a plane gear going off nearby, a plane starting nearby, that starts reaching what we call the pain threshold, where again, you're basically like not even hearing it so much as you start more just like feeling it and feeling pain, especially as you get up closer to 130 and 140, and start getting some uh, hearing loss here often. Um, if you get loud enough, often you're talking about not just permanent hearing loss, but like instant permanent hearing loss. You don't even have to listen to it for a long time the way like, yeah, this, you know, 85, it might be the damage happens over long exposures up here at 130 and 140 and so on. It's just like, if you're exposed to it, you are going to lose some hearing permanently. Basically, you're going to have some hair cells in your cochlea that are permanently damaged. If you're curious what that looks like, here it is under a microscope. Up top, we have a sort of normal, healthy set of hair cells. So these are inner hair cells and outer hair cells, but basically just a bunch of hair cells. These are neurons. These are the things that detect sound at different frequencies. And here's someone after noise-induced hearing loss. So after they've had a lot of exposure, you can see that the neurons are just messed up. Like they're not there to turn on to detect those frequencies and so can't send the signal to the brain. In other words, can't hear, can't hear those frequencies anymore. 
All right, so that's noise-induced hearing loss. As I said, we're all sort of susceptible to that. That means, though, that basically almost all of us are going to lose some of our hearing as we get older, just as we go through life over time. And there is a term for that, for this sort of progressive loss of hearing as we age. It's called presbycusis. There's a, there's a similar term for vision. We actually have a natural visual degeneration that happens to everyone as we get older. That's called presbyopia, and that just happens naturally. You can't do anything about it. Your vision just gets worse as you get older. But this version for hearing, what we call presbycusis, this is a, a progressive hearing loss. It's a sensorineural hearing loss, but it's due to cumulative damage over time. This doesn't actually have to happen. In pre-industrial cultures that don't have loud noises, don't have special drugs and medication, they don't actually suffer from presbycusis. Their hearing doesn't get worse with age. It's only if you're in the sort of modern industrialized world, when you're around loud noises and things like that, that we all then get age-related or time-related uh, damage to our hearing, this, this loss of hearing. And it's usually um, the worst at, at high frequencies. So we lose the high frequencies first, and then as we get older and older, we start to lose even some of the lower other frequencies. Here actually is a, a graph so you can see this. You can see some data here for men and women of various ages from 20 years old to 80 years old. They just use a different color line for each age. Compare the, the yellowish line at the bottom here for 80 year olds to the red line at the top for 20 year olds or the blue line below that for 30 year olds, right? Whether it's men or women, it's the same basic pattern at every frequency whether it's the low frequencies or the high frequencies. And again, remember human voices are somewhere around here, like 2,000 to 4,000, 1,000 to 5,000, somewhere in that range. But at all of those frequencies, the younger people can hear things more easily. So on the left here, what we're actually measuring, the hearing level, this is the decibels needed in order to hear something. So the, the minimum you can hear, or like what's the, yeah, the quietest thing you can hear, how many decibels does it have to be? for a given frequency. For 20 year olds, zero decibels, regardless of the frequency, they're like, I can hear it, I can hear it, I can hear it, I can hear it. But an 80 year old, especially at those higher frequencies, has to have way more decibel, like 85 decibels, almost a dangerous level of sound needed for, a, for an 80 year old to even hear a sound at 8,000 hertz. And this is a very normal, I mean, it's, a, it's high pitched, it's a little like a really high pitched voice, but basically for an 80 year old to hear someone with a high pitched voice, that person has to be at a dangerous, almost hockey game level of volume for the person to hear them. And on the other hand, they can still hear lower frequencies pretty decently. It just has to be a fair bit louder than for young people. Now, just to review, to kind of bring this back to old material, thinking back to our intro to psychophysics at the start of the course, what type of threshold is being measured here? Can you remember? And yeah, it's a absolute threshold. This is this is measuring basically the, the lowest amplitude of sound, the lowest power of sound that a person can just barely detect about 50% of the time. So it's a graph of absolute thresholds of hearing and you can see that changes with age due to presbycusis, that progressive loss of hearing that we all get if you live in the modern world. Now people have taken advantage of this for um, creating uh, interesting like um, I don't know, like products and stuff like that. So for example, one of the earliest applications was what were called sort of mosquito anti-loitering systems. Um, people would put this out near businesses that, that teens would kind of hang out and loiter around, uh, especially outside of business hours or if they just didn't want those teens nearby. And so they'd put this sound out um, that would just be a really high pitched sound that we know people who are 30 or 40 can't hear. People who are old can't hear this, but people who are under 20 can hear these super high pitched frequencies. So they would just be constantly all day long playing these annoying high pitched tones. And these kids would be like annoyed by it and leave. So it's an anti loitering system, but it doesn't bother the older people who don't even hear it. Um, but it's also been applied kind of in reverse. Uh, kids learn to apply this by by using mosquito ringtones on their phone. So like kids in, in school and in like, you know, middle school or high school and things like that might be able to hear really high pitched tones that that older people like their teachers can't hear. So they could have ringtones that they'd be able to hear the sound going off without the teacher knowing that the sound went off. Of course, it's kind of stupid because every other kid in the classroom does hear it go off. So you're still going to see like 12 heads all turn in your direction and the teacher will know something happened. But it's a funny little idea. Now, if you're curious and you want to test what frequencies you can hear, whether you can hear high frequencies, 
Um, I've linked the uh, website in the slides here. You can just Google for, for like hearing tests for different frequencies to see what high frequencies you can hear. Um, if you happen to have your, your sound turned up super loud right now, I'm going to suggest you might want to turn the volume down a little bit. You can always kind of adjust it back up. But I'm just going to play some sounds at some of these high frequencies. And you can see if you happen to hear the sound, there's a couple seconds each, but see where you, you're first able to hear the sound and kind of see where you stop being able to hear the sound. And usually if I do this live, in classrooms, uh, younger people will keep their hands up and be able to hear um, at least often up into like the, the 15,000 to 18,000 range maybe, but you know it starts to cut off pretty quick here and hands start going down and maybe just a few people in class could still hear some of these higher ones. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of people will be able to hear 10,000 hertz. So let's play this here. Again, don't have your volume super cranked up, but it's, you know, it's not that crazy. Okay, here we go. So you hear kind of like a high-pitched, annoying, squeaky background noise there. I'll play it one more time just in case you need to adjust your volume and make sure you can hear it. It doesn't need to be loud. Just make sure if you can hear it, uh, you know, you want to be able to hear it clearly here. Okay, now I'm going to go up to the next ones. You can just leave your volume at the same place. So these will all be now at an equal volume, whatever you were listening for that one, if you were okay and comfortable with it. These will all be the same volume. It's just going to be higher frequency noises here. So here's 12,000. So like I can hear that no problem. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. Often depends on your age, but maybe also how many concerts you've gone to and things like that. Here's 14,000. Again, I can hear that fine. And certainly if you turn up the volume, you'll hear it. We know that, right? But at a constant volume, uh, what we're going to find is somewhere up here for most of us, you'll start dropping off. So I'll play the next one, 15,000 hertz. And so to me, it's almost it's it's almost hard to hear. It's like a background, but like it's just a high pitched, annoying sound. Let's do sixteen thousand. Some people here start being unsure if they're even hearing it. For you, it might still be very clear, or maybe you've already lost it. But I'll play these last few just in case for those who can still hear it. So seventeen thousand. Here's eighteen thousand. Super high pitched. Okay, and then 19,000, getting close to the limits of human hearing. And then 20,000 hertz. And finally, I've said humans can hear from about 20 to about 20,000 hertz. Of course, there's individual differences here. And of course, it depends on the volume. So some people can still hear that that's 21,000 hertz, but this is getting pretty close to the limits of human hearing. So here's 21,000 And I'd be surprised if many people listening can hear this. If you can, you should be impressed. You still have pretty good uh, neurons there at the very, very base of your basilar membrane. All right. Another type of hearing damage that's super common, very, very common hearing condition is tinnitus. This actually kind of relates to, to the experience we had a moment ago listening to those annoying high-pitched kind of ringing sounds because tinnitus is a frequent or, or constant ringing in the ears but this happens when there's no physical sound there it's not caused by an actual high-pitched thing you might have been laying in bed like this happens to a lot of us you're laying in bed in a pretty darn quiet room and you just start kind of noticing this high-pitched ringing in the background high-pitched little buzz in the background and and thinking like is that like the TV still on? Is that sound coming from a neighbor or what is that? An electronics? And no, we actually know. We can measure very carefully. We know this is not from physical sound out there. It's it's sort of sound invented by your brain, but it is experienced by tons of people, many people, and usually it's people who have sensorineural damage to their hearing, say from you know going to loud concerts or using loud um, you know power tools or things like that. Uh, and especially the more sensorineural damage that people have had or the more times that, say, they've come out of a concert and had ring in their ears for a day or, you know, for the rest of the night, um, the more they've had those kind of experiences, the more likely that they'll have tinnitus later in their life. For some people, this is really, really bad, not just annoying, but can be like to the point of like causing, um, you know, mental anguish and things like that. What, what is tinnitus? Like what, what causes tinnitus? I want you to think of it this way. The, the parts of the pathway, the parts of the auditory pathway that respond to certain frequencies, they're going to stop getting input after some sensorineural neural damage, right? If you damage the neurons that pick up 19,000 hertz sounds and damage all the neurons that pick up 20,000 hertz sounds, then what's going to happen to all the neurons that are still up there in your brain 
in area A1, right, in the primary auditory cortex, there's a bunch of neurons that get their signal from the 19,000 detectors in your basilar membrane and the 20,000 detectors in your basilar membrane. Suddenly you got all these neurons in A1 that only go off for 19,000, 20,000 hertz sounds, but are now never going to get input. They're sitting up there waiting and looking and they're never getting input. So basically, those neurons, in, in essence, they become so desperate for input, they start firing from just, just to like action from nearby areas. Or, or like the brain starts amplifying their spontaneous firing rate. And we'll talk about more of that stuff with the, the third topic in the course. But really, it's, it's analogous to, to like a phantom limb, which again, we'll talk about that in the fourth topic of this course, but it's now just a phantom limb. Tinnitus is basically just phantom hearing. So it's hearing something that's not there. It is a hallucination. It's a common hallucination. Almost all of us will get it at some point in our lives or have it on and off and maybe just notice it when things are really quiet. Some people get it really bad, but it is, it is phantom hearing. It's a hallucination your brain makes. It's brain activity causing you to experience or perceive hearing even when there's no actual sound of that of that frequency coming into your ear at the time. Okay, finally at the end here for, for the hearing damage stuff, I just want to touch on one last topic related to hearing loss and that's cochlear implants. So those who are born uh, without hair cells or damaged hair cells, they're inside the cochlea, they may be candidates for a technology called cochlear implants. And what is a cochlear implant if you haven't heard of this? It's an array of electrodes, little electrical zappers, implanted inside the cochlea, like along the basilar membrane. They put these little electrical devices and the, the, that array of electrodes, they'll, they'll stimulate the proper auditory nerve fibers according to that known tonotopic map. Like thanks to Bikizi's Nobel winning discovery that we talked about earlier, we can take advantage of that orderly mapping to send signals to the auditory cortex, to the primary auditory cortex A1, and the auditory cortex has no idea whether those incoming signals are caused by actual sound out there in the environment or by our artificial way of turning on those same wires using cochlear implant, those wires that are part of the pathway from the ear to the brain. So we're kind of short circuiting things. We say, okay, maybe the bones aren't don't need to transmit the sound or anything. We'll just turn the auditory nerve fibers on directly ourselves with this little implant in the cochlea will act as an artificial cochlea basically. And it's still, the brain doesn't know the difference because all it knows is, did I get a pew, 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 neural activity coming in from the auditory nerve neurons. Now, how it works is basically there's a, a microphone hooked up outside the person's ear. Uh, so the, the microphone basically is, is attached to the ear, picks up sounds, in the environment, environmental sounds, goes to a little computer to process the sound, a transmitter sends the signal wirelessly into a receiver that's implanted inside the skull. So, so it sends from this little transmitter to a receiver that, that's inside there, done with right, surgery at some point. From there, the receiver is connected to an array of electrodes, so it goes, the wires go down to these electrodes that are in the cochlea, in that, that little you know spiral snail-like area there. So all along the basilar membrane, and that's, that's where it, it turns on and a little electrical signal there. Basically the electrodes turn on the right place the right electrodes in the right combination at the proper time in order to roughly simulate the activity in auditory nerve neurons that would have happened if the person's ears, if the person's cochlea was working normally. Unfortunately, it's not as high def as the normal cochlea, but it is enough that with experience and practice, uh, and giving the brain a chance to kind of get used to it, it can offer a, a quite detailed audio world to someone who otherwise would be auditorily deaf. Now, technically, we could leave off the microphone and just produce the frequencies we want in a computer, and someone could still have the perception of hearing without any sound waves at all. And that's because perception happens in the brain, not in the ear or the eye or the skin. Indeed, we might at some point all have implants that allow us to hear things, uh, I don't know, outside of our normal range of frequencies or to hear cell phone calls without needing a phone or being overheard by strangers. That can all happen if we just directly stimulate the brain without needing to, to stimulate any of these peripheral detectors or anything like that. Okay, now here's just a, a video, just a fun example of a, a baby having their cochlear implant turned on for the first time, responding to, to hearing mom's voice. Here we go, it's coming back on. And he's back on again. See how he turns? Turn, turn. 
Hi, Jonathan. Stop the sucking. Yeah. Hi. Good. Could you really hear good. that? <laughs> Hi, sweetie. Could you hear that? Hey. <laughs> Hi. Hi. You got that, Dad, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Jonathan. Okay, now it's important to mention here that cochlear implants, while impressive from a technological standpoint, are not universally lauded. Indeed, a lot of people in the deaf community, capital D deaf, uh, object to cochlear implants for a number of reasons, especially for deaf children who are born to deaf parents. Uh, deafness in that case is not seen as a medical condition or something that needs curing. Rather, it's more like an identity with, with uh, corresponding like complex culture and, and history and, and a language using manual signs that's, that's passed down through families. So many see deafness as a difference rather than a disability. In the, in the deaf community, capital D, uh, auditory deafness is not necessarily seen as a disability. If you're curious, I recommend you look into and read more about deaf culture. Um, for example, one classic book from uh, 1988 is Deaf in America by Carol Padden and Tom Humphreys. It's one of the, the books I show here on the screen. Um, there are a couple professors of communication who are also deaf. All right. Meanwhile, our next video is going to dive into auditory localization, so how the brain uh, makes sense of where sounds are coming from out there.